today is Dr. Theo Colmer from the University of Florida who's with us today. She really is not only a legend, but uh, to me, she's also a hero. Uh, I'll never forget the day that Our Stolen Future came out. I read it within uh, 24 hours. I, it was actually uh, uh, hard to put down for me, and uh, we continued to use it in class because uh, Theo Colburn is one of the few of us who can count herself lucky enough, I think, to really have changed uh, the field of environmental chemistry, environmental toxicology written large, uh, environmental health written large uh, for all of us. And definitely the book changed uh, the research picture at EPA and even at NIH and changed to a large extent, I think, uh, practice as well and the regulatory uh, practice. Uh, her co-authorship brought worldwide attention to the scientific discoveries about endocrine disruption and how environmental pol pollutants can cause developmental effects. We're going to hear more about that today. Her establishment and direction of the wildlife and contaminants program at the World Wildlife Fund U.S. Uh, was seminal, and her extensive, pu extensive publication record and lectureship on the consequences of prenatal exposure to synthetic chemicals by a developing embryo and fetus in wildlife, laboratory, animals, and humans. Please welcome our legend, Theo Colbert. I have to apologize. I was in an automobile accident recently, and if I get, begin to get weak in my feet and my back, I'm going to have to move over. Okay. Um, well, here we are. Let's start. I'm sure you've all had a chance to read this. Well, we live in a crazy world. <coughs> Think about this. I'll bet that everyone in this room knows what ED is, erectile dysfunction. And you do because there is profit to be made from erectile dysfunction and impotence. It's called disease mongering. Industry has poured millions into making you aware of erectile dysfunction and their high-priced recreational drugs. <coughs> but there is another ED out there where millions have also been poured into keeping it a secret, endocrine disruption. It has been to the advantage of some to discourage the use of the term because they are making huge profits on a growing list of chemicals that can interfere with the endocrine system. They do not want you to know that these chemicals are in the products found in your homes, offices, schools, and automobiles, and have penetrated every environment on the planet. Although some industries want you to believe that the chemicals they produce are safe, there is a growing body of literature that would suggest otherwise. And in what follows, I will be sharing with you some of that evidence. Remember, this discipline is only about 20 years old. And uh, so there's a short history here. No one should have been surprised at all when this story appeared in the Washington Post last year. Reports like this date back to the 1970s when the press featured stories about Bully, the young hermaphric beluga whale found dead on the shore of the St. Lawrence River, and bisexual fishing birds around the Great Lakes and gay gulls along the coast of California. But when a U.S. Geological <coughs> Service team reported bisexual bass in the Potomac River several winters ago, the Washington Post gave it the front page. And on Capitol Hill, it provoked a hearing by the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. The term endocrine disruption was used in the Federal Register right up of the hearing 131 times. Yes, I do read the Federal Register. Somebody said most people don't. <laughs> This was followed by an article in May 2007 in the Toronto Globe and Mail describing the results of deliberately dosing a Canadian lake with the active ingredient in birth control pills and the disappearance of the fathead minnows in the lake in two years. These results have raised genuine concerns about the efficiency of municipal sewage and drinking water treatment plants as other pharmaceuticals, cleaning compounds, cosmetics, and shampoos are flushed down our sinks and toilets. I heard endocrine disruptors first called stealth chemicals by Dr. Bernard Weiss in the early 1990s. And he was so right. 
endocrine disruptors fly below the government's toxicological safety nets designed to protect human health and below the radar of most doctors in clinical practice. At extremely low concentrations, they cause no visible health impairment at the time of exposure, but instead cause effects that are not expressed until years later. And if exposure takes place before birth, they can cause irreversible lifetime disorders. And even more disturbing is the fact that no, not only is the expression of damage passed on to the next generation, but in the lab, expression has now been traced through to the third and fourth generation, depending on the studies. And similarly, in humans, it has been documented with the grandchildren of women who took DES to prevent miscarriages, and with the grandchildren of women who were exposed to DDT and DDE years ago. As the technology of chemistry has become more and more sophisticated and pre precise, thanks to GCMS, endocrine disrupting chemicals are now found in all environments, including the womb environment and in all human reproductive fiber and fluids. There is no placental barrier or brain barrier to these chemicals. They are even found in the meconium, the baby's first bowel movement, where they had nine months to collect before the baby could get rid of them. Keep in mind that the endocrine system makes it possible for you to replicate yourself, to have children. Without properly functioning endocrine systems, species can go out of existence, just like the fat head minnows in the test lake. Now, ignore the X-rated glands. You all know what they are. Instead, let's look immediately at the brain, the head. Think of it as the control center and at the pituitary and the hypothalamus, critical glands that monitor hormone and enzyme levels throughout the body around the clock. And through a thermostat-like feedback mechanism, they control hormone levels throughout the body by turning on and off the production of hormones in distant glands. And the on and off production of the protein receptors in the target organs where hormones do their job. These brain parts control hormones that operate the endocrine system in the range of a part per trillion and even a part per billion. Up in the head, you will also see the hippocampus. It makes it possible for humans to process information and helps us arrive at some conclusions about the consequences of what we are doing. It is here where we learn to love, get our parenting, altruism, and empathetic instincts. This is what makes us human. The thyroid is deeply involved in reproduction and fertility and plays a major role in brain development, intelligence, and behavior. The adrenal glands through the hormone aldosterone control blood pressure and through the corticosteroids work with the immune system. And then there is the pancreas. It produces insulin, another hormone that is deep in trouble, as described by the editor-in-chief of the prestigious journal Endocrine Review this month, where he warns of a worldwide tsunami of non-immunological diabetes. We now face a pandemic of disorders in the Northern Hemisphere. Something obvious is happening at the population level that requires attention. There is now sufficient evidence from human epidemiological and lab animal studies to support the hypothesis that these disorders could, in part, be the result of prenatal exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. Before the 1950s, these were rare disorders. But since the 1970s, all of these disorders began to increase. The American Diabetes Association points out that the incidence of diabetes increased by 14% between 2003 and 2006. And if the trend continues, one in three Americans and one in two minorities born in 2007 will develop diabetes in their lifetime. 
The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that one in 150 children born has an autism spectrum disorder, and among boys, the odds are one in 89. And one in 125 boys are born with hypospadias. Danish medical doctors report a widespread condition in the Northern Hemisphere described as a male dysgenesis syndrome that can be traced back to damage in the womb. And a 2000 study showed an age-independent decline in testosterone levels in men over the past 20 years in the United States. They call this early andropause. These are all disorders that can be of fetal origin. So why has toxicology failed to detect endocrine effects? Keep in mind that most of the pioneer researchers who discovered endocrine disruption were not toxicologists. They were field and laboratory biologists, developmental biologists, medical researchers, long-term cancer researchers, and chemists who had little or no training in toxicology. They belonged to a growing community of scientists doing cross-disciplinary research in endocrine disruption. They were not locked into the traditional dogma that the dose makes the poison. I want to get to the top before I finish here. Um, and they kept getting results like these, where an agonist turns on the system and increases and to the point where the body, the brain now, remember, starts to turn off the response and the dose continues to increase. This reflects the brain at work. These cross-disciplinary researchers are dosing animals at ambient or biologically relevant concentrations, not the super high doses used for toxicological testing. So, and, and they found responses like these often at doses orders of magnitudes lower than the doses at which chemicals had previously been tested. Now, speaking of timing, let's go back to 1915 along the shoreline of the Great Lakes when huge factories began to produce free chlorine, which is still used today to purify water for millions of people around the world. But with the production of chlorine, came a byproduct, dioxin, that has now been shown to have caused the crash of the commercial fisheries in the Great Lakes in the late 30s, 1930s, because it interfered with the development of the young fish. PCBs were first produced in 1929, acting as fire retardants. And at that time, made possible the, of the rural electrification of the United States and I was a little farm girl living on a farm and I can remember electricity coming to us. In the early 1940s, at the end of World War II, DDT and a long list of chlorinated pesticides were put on the market by huge chemical companies converting to peacetime products. And each year, more and more cheap chemicals derived from the byproducts of processing crude oil and natural gas entered the market. Soon, fossil fuel-derived plastics would become the choice for building materials, packaging, and practically everything in our lives, as fire retardants, lubricants, detergents, cosmetics, toiletry, toys, and so on. We live in a plastic world. If you were born after 1950, you were exposed in the womb to many of those chemicals. And by the time you had your children in the 70s and 80s, they would have been exposed to even more kinds of chemicals and more often. As the products gradually became a part of our personal lives in our homes, workplaces, schools, and transportation systems, and so on, we were walking into them every day. We are looking today at children whose great-great-grandparents were among the first exposed in the womb and perhaps experiencing health problems that reflect their ancestors' exposure. Now, in 1970, Francois Brecker Davis, a medical doctor on my staff, published a paper in the journal Thyroid in which she described 12 different ways chemicals could interfere with the thyroid system. She also listed 89 widely used chemicals that interfere with the thyroid system. 
and of these, 65 were widely used pesticides, and of these, 24 caused over-thyroid tumors when tested in laboratory animals. Yet the EPA has taken no action to remove any of these chemicals from youth. And it has now been known for over a century that the thyroid system plays a major role in brain development and that low thyroid hormone levels during pregnancy can lead to mental retardation and cretinism. Now here you see a simple model of the role of thyroid in the development of the brain from fertilization to birth at 38 weeks. And um, you might drop down to the cochlea, but you can see down around the sixth week, the cochlea begins to develop. Uh, this is the cornucopia-shaped structure in the ear that is lined with millions of cells called hair cells that respond to sound and make it possible for us to hear. EPA scientists ran a series of three studies that show how chemicals like the PCBs can interfere with the development of the cochlea. In their first experiment, the EPA scientists induced loss of hearing and motor control in pups whose mothers were dosed during pregnancy with a prescription drug, propylthiouracil, that blocks the thyroid hormone. Second, they dosed another set of rat mothers with PCBs and got the same effects. Third, to make sure that the damage was thyroid related, they treated another set of mothers with PCB plus T4 or thyroxin, which ameliorated the problem, demonstrating that PCBs damage the development of the ear before birth through a thyroid mechanism. The exposed rat pups did not hear low and intermediate frequency sound. The special hair cells that respond to sound in the cochlea did not develop normally in the rats. Now, children with learning disabilities often have difficulty processing information because they don't hear sound normally. They have difficulty with phonics, making it difficult to learn to read, and then don't do well in school. There are now a number of healthy mother-child studies from around the world where increasing blood levels of PCBs have been associated with increasing cognitive loss and behavioral difficulties in their children. And let's turn to one of these now. We're a cohort of 189 children whose cord blood was assayed for PCBs. And at 4.5 years of age, we're given what is called a continuous performance test, called the catch the cat. The test measured their lack of control of impulsive responding, an ADHD-like symptom. The children sat before a laptop computer and were shown a picture of a house with windows in it and told them that an apple, a butterfly, or a cat might show up in one of the windows. The child was given a joystick to click every time he or she saw a cat. The time it took to respond between 200 and 3,000 milliseconds was a correct answer. And any click that took less than 200 or more than 3,000 milliseconds and a click when there was no cat was called an error of commission. The children were graded according to their errors of commission. Then, at, eight, at seven to eight years of age, 30 of the children with the highest concentration of PCB at birth and 30 of the children with the lowest PCB concentrations had an MRI brain scan that revealed differences among the children in the volume in square millimeters of their splenium. And I'm sure most of you have never heard of the splenium, and I didn't until they found this problem. The areas of the brain that the splenium connects plays a role in visual recognition and discrimination. And the splenium also integrates that with proper motor response. So here you see the relationship between the children's cord blood PCB concentrations and errors of commission as a function of splenium volume. Those with the smallest splenia were the most vulnerable to the effects of PCBs. And some of these children could not sit on their chairs. They kept falling off. Others kept hitting the joystick button continually, and they could not stop. It became completely out of control. Now let's look at these results, breaking them out, comparing boys with girls. And you will see 
that the boys made twice as many errors of commission as girls. Now, in this next study, 13% of the children in the first through the fifth grade in a public school in North Carolina, in a North Carolina county, were on prescribed medication for ADHD. Looking at the fourth and fifth grade alone, 15% of the boys were affected and 5% of the girls. The authors emphasize that these are underestimates of the problem and interestingly, keep this in mind, autism, another neuron developmental problem, which I mentioned earlier, affects three to nine times more boys than girls, depending on the study and who is reporting. So now let's switch into high gear now and look into this problem called the male predicament. It appears that the boys are more at risk than girls even before they are born. In Japan, between 1970 and 1996, the ratio of the male-female fetal deaths, deaths before birth, reached almost two in 1996. In other words, the boys were dying twice as often as the girls before they were born. Now, this could not have been done in this country because the sex of fetal deaths are not recorded. But the author of this paper suggests that perhaps synthetic chemicals may be weeding out some of the boys before, their birth, before birth. Now, epidemiologists in this country, in Canada, reviewed male and female live birth ratios from approximately 1970 to 1995 and reported a decline over the 25 years. The Canadians were able to go back in their records as far as 1930 and found that the decline did not start in Canada until 1970, which fits the timeline when one would begin to expect to see an effect at the population level. They had a cumulative loss of 2.2 males per thousand births across Canada, reported at the last uh, count, and in the eastern Atlantic region of Canada, around the Great Lakes and Ontario, the loss was 5.6 male, uh, male births per thousand between 1970 and 1990. And that had a p-value of 0.001. This significant decline in male births in eastern Canada is reinforced by the results of this report that may provide an explanation for the obvious sex ratio in Eastern Canada, where almost twice as many girls than boys are born in this Sarnia First Nation population. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, using data from the Atlanta, Atlanta metropolitan area, predicted that overall major birth defects in males were 3.9% compared with 2.8% for females. Defects of sex, of sex organs were 8.5 times more prevalent among males than females. And of course, boys have external genitalia, more that can be looked at, that may have biased that. But urinary tract defects were 62% more prevalent, and gastrointestinal tract defects were 55 more prevalent in the males. The authors listed environmental chemical exposure as possibly causing this urina these urinary tract problems. The same team of researchers found that one in 125 boys in the same Atlanta area were born with hypospadias, a defect where the urethra does not open at the end of the penis. They also reported that the severe cases are increasing more than the milder forms. In a more recent nationwide study from Denmark found hypospadias one in 118 male live births, which is very close to this U.S. figure. And as in the U.S., the Danes found that more, the more severe the cases were, they, uh, those were the ones that were increasing. But it's important to keep in mind that hypospadias is an underreported event. Doctors are reluctant to put it on the birth record because it might stigmatize the boy and his family. And most important, because insurance companies are reluctant to insure boys with hypospadias because their odds are high, high that they will basically, uh, their, their odds are high in that they will develop fertility problems and testicular cancer as they mature 
we need to try to get the insurance company to tell us about some of this stuff. They know a lot that they're not sharing with the public. There's new evidence from the Netherlands that hypostasis could be the result of second generation exposure. The grandsons of women who took DES, a female hormone to prevent miscarriages, have a significantly increased risk of developing hypostasis compared with boys whose mothers were not exposed to DES through their grandmothers. Now this finding is just one example of a long delayed impacts that a foreign chemical can have in the womb environment a third generation child affected by its grandmother's exposure. Here you see a picture of hypostasis. Now the hole actually should be up at the tip. This is halfway down the shaft, and the closer it gets to the body, the condition becomes more and more severe, and the hole can be as low as scrotal area or in the perineum. This disorder is the result of disturbances around the seventh to the eighth week of gestation in humans at what is called sexual differentiation. At this time, under normal conditions, the Y chromosome kicks in and the male fetus's adrenal gland produces a small amount of testosterone that starts a cascade of chemical changes and events that initiate the growth of the fetus and the urethra together. A number of chemicals have now been shown to interfere with the penile urethra signaling system in a number of ways. And chemicals that do this now are called anti-androgens. And I'm going to give you a little relief here, visual relief. And I don't think endocrine disruptors have anything to do with this geological formation. Um, I want to digress here now for a minute to remind you that it was not until the 1990s, or mid-1990s, after Dr. Lou Gillette, a wildlife biologist, visited the US EPA lab in North Carolina where he showed his pictures of some alligators with little phalluses or penises from Lake Apopka, Florida, that anyone realized that there were anti-androgens in the environment that hadn't been for these alligators. When the EPA scientists Earl Gray and Bill Kels saw the pictures of the alligators' gonads, they asked the biologist what he thought the animals might be exposed to. And he said it was, he thought it was DDE the persistent breakdown product of DDT. Well, it did not take the EPA folks long to do some lab studies and get into some heavy chemistry and announce that DDE is a powerful anti-androgen. It causes hypostasis and other male developmental problems such as undescended testicles, reduced sperm count, and sperm quality in laboratory rats. Here you see the effects of anti-androgen effect in the rat on the right. Oops. Wait, if I didn't get, I haven't been clicking very well. Okay, here we go. Here you see um, the effects of DDE on the rat on the right. Uh, his mother was exposed to DDE. He has very short anogenital distance. Let's take the time here to show you the anus, the anogenital distance. Here's the normal rat. This is what it should look like. He also didn't have, he didn't have descended testicles. Anyway. Um, DDE is found in almost all living tissue around the world even today. It has a long half-life. The list of anti-androgens is slowly growing and includes some of the widely used phthalate plastic additives found in rubber ducks and other cuddly toys, cosmetics, perfumes, shampoos, flexible plastic products, and so on, and also as an inert ingredient in pesticides. And like so many other chemicals, they are found in 98% of all human, tested, human tissue tested. And before we leave the topic of hypospadias, I would like to point out here that if it, if it had not been for Florida's Lake Woodruff National Wildlife Refuge, a relatively pristine oasis, far from agricultural or industrial activity, public health officials would have never been aware of the high prevalence of hypostasis among the human population. You see, prior to this, no one knew what an alligator's normal external genitalia and hormone chemistry should look like. The alligators from Lake Woodruff provided the gold standard for normal gonadal development and reproductive success in an alligator population. 
without those relatively unexposed Lake Woodruff animals serving as controls because they were producing at the rate of 90% or better compared with the Popka gators at 10%. Scientists might never have determined that there are chemicals in the environment that act as anti-androgen. And I am certain that the CDC, the Centers for Con uh, Disease Control, would never have been convinced to look for the prevalence of hypostatias in the human population or to start monitoring phthalates in urine in thousands of people across the country. So now let's look at some of this wonderful chemistry that we've been talking about all day today. Um, they took a random sample. The CDC took a random sample nationwide. Well, they looked at 10,000 people, but basically then took a random sample from that and came up with this result using monobutyl phthalate. Note that the majority of the people had about 30 parts per billion in their urine over there on the right. Keep that 30 parts per billion in mind. Those subjects on the right, though, from about 120 uh, parts per billion on, um, were all women. And they were women of childbearing age from 17 to 41. And they held significantly higher concentrations, as you can see, than the men in the study. The men were over on the left-hand side. In laboratory animals, Phthalates also act as anti-androgens and undermine male development if exposure takes place at the time of sexual differentiation when the male gonads begin to develop. And in the lab, shortened anal genital distance, remember I showed you, has so far proven to be the most sensitive endpoint to detect an anti-androgen in animal studies. So what did the human epidemiologists do? In this study, the urine of pregnant women was sampled throughout their pregnancies from various maternity clinics across the United States. Shortly after birth, their son's anal genital distance and penile volume were measured, which turned out to predict the tendency toward partially descended or completely undescended testicles, reflecting similar results seen in lab animal studies. The researchers came up with what they called the AGD index. And look here at the concentration of the MVP found in the women whose boy had, boys had the lowest index. When you ask mothers and fathers, where is their baby, they'll always tell you their baby is over here. But look at this difference. So anyway, and probably one of the most provocative uh, papers on the human male predicament came from a Danish study in 1992 when they released the first meta-analysis of international sperm count studies that showed a 50% drop in sperm count and reduced semen quality between 1939 and 1990. As with other groundbreaking reports, there was a great deal of skepticism about the credibility of this paper. Tremendous amount of back and forth push it, and anyway, in response to the tremendous effort to deny the results by the trade associations, Dr. Shauna Swan added some new studies to the original studies chosen by the Danes and redid the statistics using every statistical package the skeptics said the Danes should have used and confirmed the Danes' earlier studies. Then in 2001 and 2002, the Danish team, led by Dr. Nils Skakibach, commenced to describe what they called the male dysgenesis syndrome, which I mentioned earlier. The team points out that the male dysgenesis syndrome has become increasingly common and that it is a result of disruption of embryonal programming and development during fetal life. They point out that the disorders are expressed over a span of many years as the patient ages. And as a patient moves from one doctor to another, the big picture is missed. Consequently, the increasing trends were overlooked because of specialization in medicine. From the obstetrician to the pediatricians, endocrinologists, urologists, andrologists, and oncologists, all seeing <coughs> the patients independently, they never got the whole picture together. They suggest that future epidemiology not focus on just one symptom alone, but be more comprehensive as well. And it is interesting to note that boys with autism 
have a greater risk of developing hypospadias and intestinal disorders. It should be no surprise that a chemical present in the womb environment can cause damage to multiple systems that are developing at the same time. So taking the Danish team's suggestion, my team has put together something I want to share with you. And I want you to think about this first. Why would not several developing organ systems be vulnerable at the same time if a foreign chemical were present in the womb environment, particularly in those early weeks of cell development? We wondered if there might be a way, a very simple way, to take the vast amount of data at our disposal to present a broader picture of the etiology of more than one disorder. Something like what the Danes suggested. So taking their lead and focusing on the first 38 weeks of life during one's excursion in the womb, could this information be packaged in one relatively easy model that most people could understand and be internet accessible? So here you see our attempt to produce a simple model of normal human development of some of the critical systems and organs necessary to construct a baby from fertilization, fertilization to birth broken out over the 38 weeks. With your mouse, you will be able to wander anywhere on the graph and click on a tick and read what takes place at that stage of development. And here you see testosterone production. And then you will be able to click on that and the citation will pop up. Now next, you will be able to go to the toolbar on top where it says, <coughs> excuse me, select a chemical and click. And in this case, I selected bisphenol A, one of the most, of the highest profile chemical of today, believe me, and most contentious chemical in the market today. Here, you see every body system where there is evidence that BPA can interfere with or alter the development of the baby systems or organs. What you see here was taken from laboratory studies using only one microgram per kilogram of body weight, that's one part per million. BPA has become so popular that over six billion pounds were produced globally in 2003. BPA does not bioaccumulate like other poster child chemicals have. Yet it is found in virtually everyone's tissue about one to two parts per billion because it is so versatile, versatile and we are exposed to it so often and it has now been incorporated into practically every product society depends upon today. Now, I have just spent the last 35 minutes talking about the male predicament. Let's go down and home in on the male reproductive system. And you can click on a red chick here, and also you will, get, you will get to see what was discovered at that particular time, and then you can click again, actually, uh, and, and pull up the citation. Now, if you have not heard already, you should be aware that the FDA released a draft document on Friday declaring that BPA is safe and is not harmful at its current levels of application. This is a typical example of a politically driven decision, I am sure, in light of the fact that today in California, the legislature is looking at a new bill to ban bisphenol A from certain products. With this release, the FDA, FDA strategically bypassed important information even before its draft document went through a period of, of public comp comment. They haven't finished reporting on this from the FDA yet. Interestingly, to come to its conclusion, the FDA did not use the reports cited in our critical window of development study that includes a great deal of research done by the top scientists in the U.S. and funded by the most respected U.S. government programs. The FDA also set itself up for criticism by releasing its draft before, before, re, report before the release of the NIEHS and National Tox Program report on the safety of BPA based on this more sophisticated and sensitive research. It is apparent that the FDA 
is stuck in traditional toxicology and is not ready to accept new, more protective standards for the safety of chemicals. The Canadian government was not fooled. It has already banned BPA in baby bottles. And it would be very interesting if we could find out who lobbied for releasing this draft report prematurely. So, can we resolve the male predicament and alter the spiraling downward course of public health that is threatening future generations? I think we can, if we move fast and take a new approach. Somehow we have to bridge the disconnection between what clinicians are dealing with every day in their practice and the design of the testing programs the government is doing to address the problem. Almost two decades have been lost since endocrine disruption was recognized and 12 years since EPA was told to come up with a set of screens and assays to detect endocrine disruptors. Up to now, the government has let endocrine disruption be dominated by those who got it wrong. And most important, the problem cannot be solved by looking for cures and treatments. Instead, the mission or purpose of this new approach, if it is to succeed, must be prevention and precaution. The task now must be given to those who discovered endocrine disruption and understand the significance of ambient exposure and timing. Those people should be brought to the table to tackle the problem and most important, those without conflicts of interest. There is an urgent need for the creation of many new multidisciplinary teams of biomedically trained scientists, including chemists, who will step outside their discipline to work together to help flesh out the chemistry that controls gestation and function in order to develop the protocols needed to weed out endocrine disruptors. These teams will be doing some of the most important research in the 21st century, inner space research, research for peace. In order to do this, the government is going to have to come up with vast sums of extramural money for campuses where the dying discipline of developmental biology can be revived, where the growing discipline of endocrine disruption can thrive, and where an army of young people will be trained as scientists and health professionals to carry out the mission. The bottom line in this new campaign will be the health and welfare of future generations. We have rapidly become a caretaker society where an increasing percentage of our population is dependent upon medications or care from the time they are born until they die. The trend does not appear to be lessening Today, in the U.S., we are spending more money on treating diabetes than on education. We are producing fewer and fewer tax-paying citizens. We are producing more and more children with learning disabilities and serious social problems. We are now moving into the fourth generation of individuals exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the womb. The statistics tell us that something is wrong with the human condition and that males are targeted, and that the time is getting short. We need leaders who will take endocrine disruption out of the closet. Let's face it, we must clean up the womb environment if we're going to have enough fully functioning individuals with the cognition, steadfastness, leadership ability, and courage to place human health above the bottom line and take back government from corporations in order to solve this problem. We need leaders who can see the link between the global pandemic of irreversible disorders and the dire need to find alternatives to fossil fuels. We need to act fast. If there is only one message you take away from this lecture, I want it to be that a vast number of widely dispersed fossil fuel derived chemicals are altering how our children are constructed before they are born and how they behave and function in adulthood and could be posing a more imminent threat than climate change to the survival of humans and all living organisms on Earth. And where I live in the West, 
We often see reminders like this of the good old days before endocrine disruptors and the need for Viagra and Cialis. I call them symbols of hope. And at this point, I would like to just acknowledge some of the organizations that have supported us. We're a small group, but we have good support. And I definitely want to show you where you can go. If you're interested in the data that appeared on the screen, go to endocrinedisruption.org and hit products and then hit BPA. And there are over 335 studies listed there of one part per million or less. And we expect to have the other product that I'm talking about. It's going through a very intense review process now and also trying to get all the glitches out of it as far as being able to, anybody can get it on their computer at home. Uh, we should have that up hopefully right after the first of the year. And I want to thank you for your time. <laughs>